Welcome, Pastor Scott. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be able to listen to your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for allowing that word to be quickened into our lives. I thank you, Lord, that we are set apart or sanctified by that word, which is your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you just instruct us, you guide us, you rebuke us, Lord, through your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can receive that kind of instruction from your spirit that you gave us to guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. How many here have ever been a, um, a Boy Scout, been involved with the Boy Scouts or anything? I remember I was, you know, a Cub Scout when I was younger, then, then was involved with the Boy Scouts. And we had this, uh, there was a motto that we had. And that motto that was, that was from the founder in the early 1900s was just two words, and it was be prepared. That was the basic motto of the Boy Scouts, to be prepared. And so we were always uh, learning things, and, you know, that when we went into the woods, that you would go into the woods, you know, and, and you would be prepared. We learned first aid in order to be prepared, okay, things like that. And so we want to get our lives. As Christians, we should be prepared uh, for, for all things. And, uh, and one of the things that really sparked this in me was I was reading about David. If you turn to First Samuel uh, chapter 17. Now, this is a, a familiar scripture. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, we know the story, David, uh, who was, you know, anointed king over Israel, but this is the story before he became king. This is the story that we all know. This is the story that we've all read about, heard about uh, in Sunday school, you know, and this is the story of David and Goliath, which, uh, but there's, but there's some under, there's some things I want to bring out in this today, if we can, that and one of the things that I want to tell you is that when David, you know, that, that Goliath was taunting, and Goliath was from uh, the, the nation of Philistia, okay, he was a Philistine. And what had happened is there was war between the Israelites and the Philistines. And the, the, the commander of the Israelite army was Saul. And the champion, uh, the great fighter for the Philistines, was a big guy. He was approximately nine feet tall. Um, and his name was Goliath. And what happened is they were both on each side of the valley. The Israelites was on one side and the Philistines was on another. And they, 40 days went by. There was no fighting going on, just taunting, really from the one side. And the big guy was coming down and he was basically taunting the nation of Israel. Now Israel, how many know Israel was God's people? These were the people that God raised up. These are the people that had a covenant with God. Okay, the Philistines didn't have that covenant with God. And so this guy comes down, he's taunting the Israelites and basically what he was saying in a nutshell after, you know, mocking them somewhat is he says, why do we have to go to battle with everybody? He goes, this, you know, I'm the, I'm the top warrior here. You just send out your top guy. And uh, well, just, just two of us, just the two of us will fight. Whichever one wins, the other one will be the servants. The other side will be the servants. It's that simple. We'll just do it that way. Now, he did this every day. He was doing this every day and every day and every day. Now, David wasn't there. He wasn't there. He wasn't in the army. He was a little younger. Now, just to understand something, David wasn't, wasn't a little boy either, okay? He was older. He was a teen, you know, and he was, he was older and uh, an older teen. He was a shepherd and things. So he comes, he comes up. His father, Jesse, calls him and says, listen, I want you to go up and find out what's going on because, you know, we haven't heard anything for a while. I want to get the news. You know, they weren't able to tune into the, the fake media like CNN, but they, they couldn't. They didn't know what was going on. So he said, uh, just, you know, can you you know, tell us what's going on. Send, go up there, see the commander, take him some food and things like that. Talk to your brothers. They had three older brothers that were there. Find out and tell me what's going on. So he gets up there. All of a sudden, Goliath comes out. Now, everybody else has been listening to this for 40 days, and here's David. First time he hears it, boom, something sparks in him. Something sparks him. You know why? Can I tell you this? David was prepared. He had already been prepared for that moment. He didn't get there and say, huh, you know, what, what, he already knew what to do, see? Now, we'll pick it up from there. David hears it, and all of a sudden, David's like, why is everybody afraid of this guy? And you're thinking, well, look at him. I mean, the guy's nine feet tall. He's carrying these big spears and things. I mean, he's just massive. There's nobody that can match this guy strength for strength. There's just no way you're going you're gonna to beat him on a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And David's like, this is, and this is what David says, this is an uncircumcised Philistine. Now, when he says uncircumcised, what he means is this guy has no covenant with God. 
He has no relationship with God. How, you know, if we're God's people, David understood, see, he understood who he was in the Lord. He knew that God's, God was backing him. So they took, they, all of a sudden, here's the only guy out of the whole army that had a little bit of faith. He was talking faith. And so they brought him to Saul. Okay, and we'll pick up there, and we're in uh, 1 Samuel 17, and we'll pick up verse 31. 1 Samuel 17, 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. Hey, he sends for him. He's the only guy that volunteered here, so bring him to me. David says, don't let anyone's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul says to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth. He's been a man of war since his youth. In other words, he's saying this guy, this guy his entire life has been trained to be a killer. You're just a, you're just a young man, and you just, you're, all you are is a shepherd. How could you possibly go against somebody who's trained his whole life to be a killer? How can you possibly go and match up with this guy? Verse 34, but David says to Saul, watch this, he says, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it, and I struck it, and I delivered that lamb from its mouth, and when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, I struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. So David speaks faith. He says, listen, this, this ain't my first rodeo. Okay, he said, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm not afraid of this. I've been prepared. Even though you don't think I've trained to be a killer, but I have. I was responsible for sheep. And whenever beasts came after them, a lion or a bear, I struck them down and I killed them. Now, what do you think David was doing out there in the fields all day also? There was a couple things we understand. He was worshiping God. That was one of the things he was doing. He had a relationship with the Father. He knew who God was. He believed God. He knew the word of God, too. That's why he had faith, because he knew who his God was. He, knew the, he, knew, he read about the exploits that God had done with the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt and all the things that, that God had blessed them with and the things that he did with Moses and Abraham. He knew all that, see? So he was, he was already... You know, he, he believed the word of God. Not only that, he was practicing out there with his weapons. David was a master slinger. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times we read this. Now, I remember years ago sharing this, uh, that, that with that sling, that David took a sling. We know that, okay? Now, this was not the sling where you took the, you know, where you have the two posts like the thing and you pull back, that type of sling. This was one that was a leather strap that they would swing. Now, this, and again, this is no kid's toy. Okay, so we got mixed up in Sunday school sometimes, believing that little David was like a three-year-old or something, or five-year-old, and he went out there, you know, and just slung his little toy sling around. This was a weapon of warfare. This was used in battles, okay? And the guys that used these weapons were very proficient with them, okay? They, 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 could, they could sling a, uh, a stone, and they could, they could nail exactly what they were doing. I mean, they, 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 were, very, they were accurate, and they were deadly. So this, is a, this, was a, this was a deadly weapon that David had. And he knew how to use it. Why? He was prepared. I want you to understand that. When he stepped out against the giant, he had that sling. Now, now Saul didn't understand that because Saul said, okay, all right, I'll send you out, but you have to do it my way. You have to fight the way we've been trained to fight. How many know we all have a unique anointing? You understand that? We're, we're unique. Okay? I remember, you know, years ago, whenever... Uh, before we started a ministry and things like that, uh, the pastors say, you know, well, you can't preach. Well, I can't preach like you. Okay? Well, you get, in other words, and then somebody else told me, it's too bad, it's too bad you never went to Bible college because you'd have made a good pastor. I said, oh, is that the requirement? You know, I said, they said, you have to go to four years Bible college in order to be a pastor. I said, I don't, I didn't see, I, I must have missed that scripture. And see that in there, you know. And then, then, then you're studying, and there's, there's this, uh, this, 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 one of the courses in Bible college is homiletics, and basically homiletics is a fancy word to teach you how to preach. 
I tried it. I really did. Um, they tell you, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the formula. You have to, you know, when you, when you preach, you want to have an introduction. And then you want to have three to five points that you make. And then you want to have a conclusion, you know, all that. I tried that. Half the time I finished my messages and Tammy goes, what do you want to call that one? I'm like, I don't know. I don't really have a title for it. I just kind of went everywhere, you know. But you, ha- you know what? I had to be me. I had to be me. I, c- I couldn't learn and say, well, I have to be like this person or I have to do it that way. I had to recognize what God had put within me. And I had to do what God called me to do. And I didn't try to pattern myself after anybody. I did for a while. It didn't work. And that's what happened with David. He stuck all that armor on, and he's trying to. Now, Saul was a big guy, too, see? So he sticks Saul's armor on. He's trying to walk. He goes, I can't even walk in this thing. And then he, Saul straps his sword on David, and David's like, I, I don't even know how to use a sword. I never used one of these things before. That's not... I'll go out and fight this guy, but I can't do it your way. I'll step into the ministry. I'll do what God's called me to do, but I can't do it like everybody else does it. That's not who I am. That's not the gifts God gave me. David said, now I got a sling and I know how to use it. And I don't need all this heavy armor either because he said, I'm not fighting a defensive battle. I'm going on the offense. I'm going with my weapons. I see a lot of times what happens is this. Now don't misunderstand my words. So David just went out and had faith in God. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Let me tell you what he had faith in. He had faith in the word of God that he knew, and he had faith in the gifts that God gave him, the talent and gifts that God put in him. That's what he had faith in. You could say, well, he just, all he did was just, he just slung that thing around, let it go, and an angel directed it. No. Let me tell you something. David knew what he was doing, and he knew how to sling one of those things, and he could hit that guy right between the eyes exactly where the armor was not. He knew how to do, use that. It wasn't a lucky shot. It wasn't, I'll just let it go out there and let God direct it. Now, I have faith in the ability that God gave me, and I've used it. See, a lot of this, these ideas that we see in, in, in the church today or with Christians today is, God's called me to do this or that. I just trust him. Okay, well, did you do anything to prepare? You see, when God called me to the ministry, I just didn't sit back and wait for an open door. You know what I did? I, I, I looked for places to preach. There wasn't too many, but there was more than you realize. I went, I went around to the nursing homes, and I volunteered. I said, I'll go, you know, you, they said, oh yeah, er, Sunday afternoons we do services for the, for the people. Okay. I said, I'll come and share. So I started doing it. We, did, we went to two or three different ones and started going Sunday afternoons. After church, we would go to these rest homes, nursing homes, and I would preach there. Now, half the people were incoherent, okay? So the other half couldn't hear anyway. But it was a good opportunity, you know what I mean? It was all right. So I stood up and preached. I remember the first message I ever preached. It was three full pages long. Three full pages. I wrote out all my notes and everything I was going to say and finished it in like 15 minutes because I basically just read down through, you know, the thing. Now, I doubt if anybody ever remembers any of the messages I ever preached in these places, okay, because they weren't that good. And I wasn't that good of a preacher anyway. I just shared the word, you know, I just, I just by faith, stepping out, you know, get, what am I doing? I'm preparing, see, I'm preparing. Now, after a while, you know what everybody said? We'd go to these places, and, and nurses would come up to us, or the director would come up to us, and they said, you're their favorite. You're the favorite. They ask for you all the time. Now, let me tell you, they weren't asking me because of my preaching. Okay? Because when we were, see, here's what I did. When we were done, we went to, around individually to every one of those people. In, see, this is what the others did not do. We went around individually, and we touched them, held their hands, Gave them hugs. Asked for prayer. Asked, what, what do you want? What would you like us to agree with you in prayer? Talked with them how they were doing. Just started, you know, getting together with them. They couldn't, they, they could care less what I preached, see. We were making contact with them and developing relationships. That's what happened. And so, and here's what I found. So here's these people. You think that they're, you think, well, God's not using these people. They're in these, they're in these nursing homes you know, half the time, they're, you know, they, they, they're, they're weak, they're in wheelchairs, they're confined and all that. We would go around asking, what do you want, to, what do you want, what can I agree with you in prayer? Almost every one of them 
Very few ever ask for prayer for themselves. Every one of them was asking for prayer for their children and grandchildren. And you realize that these people were still around because their prayers were still affecting the generations after them. Can you pray for my daughter? Can you pray for my grandson? Can you pray? They're going through this or they're going through that. And we would, okay. And we just would, would just grieve with prayer. And oh, they were just the happiest people to know that, we, that they had somebody to agree with them for their children and grandchildren. That's how we learned. That's what we learned to do. Years after that, we started, we said, went to our pastor and said, hey, is it all right if we do a home group? We just, you know, I just want to start teaching the word of God. Yeah, sure, you know. So we started a home group, did that for five years. This is how, see, this is preparation. We got into the word of God. We started studying the word of God. We were studying it every night. And we were just, we were listening to, to teachings and we were reading ourselves and we were, we were teaching and training. And this is preparation because we knew the day would come. Now, we didn't know when it was going to be. We were just, you know, wanted to follow the Lord, but we were getting ourselves ready. Now, here's what's funny sometimes and, and, and sad at the same time is you'll talk to people about the Word of God and say, but they don't need it right now. Everything's going good, see? But you just know. See, what, what happens when that time comes? What happens whenever tragedy strikes? What happens whenever you lose your job? What happens whenever you lose a, a, a family member? What happens whenever things come against you? What happens when you find out your child's on drugs? What happens whenever so life happens? Now what? And what we experience, a lot of panic takes place because they don't have anything in here to give out. So they're calling and they're asking, and it's not wrong to ask for prayer. Don't, get me, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But a lot of times they're asking because they don't have it themselves. So this is where you need the word of God. And then they're trying, they're trying to play catch up. You know, Pastor Tammy was passing out. In the last, if you haven't got it, you can ask her. She, she has a thing that she was in the last couple of years really ministered her uh, a teaching that was called, I forget what it's called, about uh, healing. You're already healed. So, so she's listening to it and she's telling people, I'm listening to this tape. And they said, are you sick? She goes, no, I'm not sick. Why are you listening to a, a, a teaching on healing then? She said, because when the attack comes, I won't already have this in me. She listened to it like a dozen times. She listened to it a, do a dozen times. She handed it out there. She, we send it to people. People don't even come here, other people. She's always sending it around, and, and people are like, you know, some of the people listen to it, and they say, oh, I don't know about that. That's a, that's, that's a hard message. Well, it's the word of God. And, or other ones will say, well, I don't really need that. I'm pretty healthy. There's no, you don't understand. Do you know what preventative maintenance is? See, I grew up, I remember, you know, uh, we had this big, we had this nice garage. And uh, we always worked on our cars in there ourselves. Learned how to do that ourselves. And uh, so we were always, you know, doing something. We were always pulling the tires off and checking the brakes and checking the tires and, you know, rotating the tires and changing the oil and doing all that stuff. There was nothing wrong with the car. You understand? We were doing what's called preventative maintenance we learn you know why you learn first aid you don't learn in first aid because because you, you had an accident you're learning first aid for when something happens and somebody else has an accident or you do have an accident you know what to do because you've learned those procedures we put the word of god in us even when we quote don't think we need it because times are going to come when you're going to need it and then what's going to happen you're struggling to open the Bible. What, where's that scripture? I need to say, you know. No, you don't need to do that because you've already got it in you, see. It's so in you that whenever those times come, you know exactly what to say. You know exactly what to speak. You know exactly what to do because you've been instructed and trained in that. So David was prepared, and when he got to that battlefront and he saw that guy, he, he had no question. He knew what to do, and he was confident in the gift that God had given him to sling a stone. He also knew the word of God. Leviticus. I don't turn there, but I'll just tell you. The word of God says that there is a penalty. Leviticus tells us this in the law. There's a penalty for blasphemy. A penalty. If somebody blasphemes the Lord God, just like Goliath was doing, Leviticus says, according to the word of God, they must be taken out and they must be executed publicly 
by stoning. They will publicly be stoned in front of everybody. Do you understand that David took that word and that's what he did to the man that was blaspheming God? He went right out where everybody could see it in public in front of everybody and he stoned them. And he brought about the word of God by executing the, the blasphemer in front of everybody. But see, he took the word of God. You, you got to look at the weapons you have. She shared that, that story on the mission trip. We weren't caught off guard when we saw this stuff. This stuff, that was, some, of, some of the stuff will shake you a little bit when you see demon-possessed people coming at you and the things they say and do, okay? But we weren't shaken. Everybody else was shaken. Everybody else was scared. They didn't know what to do. But we knew what to do. You know why? Because we had studied the Word of God. We knew, according to the Word of God, we knew we had authority. Now, let me just say this. We didn't feel like it. Okay? We, we didn't feel like we had authority over these demonic spirits. We didn't feel like it. But we knew, according to the Word of God, we did. So we did not back down. We did not run away. We did not enter into fear. Okay? We strengthened ourselves, stirred ourselves up in the Spirit of God, and stood our ground and spoke to the demonic spirit and commanded it to come out, and it left. It left. Screaming and whatever they do, they're not happy, but, you know, we kicked them out. Why? Because the Word of God says we can do it. And we read that. We were trained in that. We were trained with the Word of God so that when these things came against us, we knew what to do. We were already prepared. Already prepared. You know, um, all right, what did I say? He trusted in the gifts, of, I'm going to my notes, <laughs> trusted in the gifts and the tools that God had given him. Okay, the Word of God, the Word of God is implanted. You know the Word of God has to, the Word of God does no good with the Bible on a shelf, right? It's got to get inside. It has to be planted. And you want to plant it ahead of time. How many love, how many love in, in, you know, around August here in western Pennsylvania when we, get the, when we get ripe tomatoes? Aren't those the best? And you go to the store now and you get those things that are kind of like pinkish and they're like, have no flavor, and, you know. But boy, in August when those things come forth, isn't that great? How many know that when August comes and you start seeing people eating those ripe tomatoes, you can't go plant your tomatoes at that time and expect to get ripe tomatoes. You understand? Because the people that are bringing forth ripe tomatoes, they already did something months before. They already took their seeds or their plants and they already put them in the ground. They already prepared the soil. They already got that ready. And now, they're, now the harvest is here. See, you can't then say, oh, I want some of those too. I'll just put my seed in the ground in August but guess what? You ain't getting no tomatoes because you, you waited too long. You had to do it ahead of time. You got, see, and this is what happens with people with the Word of God. I'll just wait till I have a problem, then I'll get into the Word. You don't want to do that. It's too late then. It's never too late to get in the Word of God, but it could be late for that situation. You want to get in the Word of God now. You want to do what's called preventative maintenance. You want to be prepared. You want to get that word into you now so that when the time comes, you can reap the harvest. Amen? You also need to understand, and I've shared this uh, a number of times, about faith being your servant. And that's a whole message. I don't know if I have time to get into it today. I might not, so I probably won't do that. Um, but understand that everyone has been given a measure of faith. I'll just say it really quickly. Everyone has been given a measure of faith, according to the word of God. You need to understand that faith, there's a, there's a passage in, the script in, in, in Luke, I think it's Luke 17, where the, where the apostles come to Jesus and say, and they, here's what they say, increase our faith. How many have ever asked God to increase your faith? You say, God, just give me, give me more faith, give me more faith. Well, guess what? You know what the answer is? I'm not doing that. God, that, that's basically, we can infer that from the scripture, but God told the apostles that, that that's not the way it works. He said, he said this, you already got it. You, everyone has a measure of faith. Now, the way that faith increases is not God increasing your faith. He's not going to increase it. You have to do something with it. In other words, you've got to plant it. Faith, God says faith's like a mustard seed. Now, what do you do with a seed? You plant it. Now, here's the problem. Mustard seed, that mustard seed message has been taught wrong in the church for a lot of years. Everybody always teaches that. Well, I just need a little bit of faith. Just need a little bit of faith. Just need a little bit of faith. 30 years later, they still have their little bit of faith. So, wait a minute. What did you do with that seed other than carry it around your pocket for 30 years? 
That seed is to go in the ground. That seed is to be planted. Because the, 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 the principle of mustard seed is not a little bit of faith. The principle of the mustard seed is potential for great faith. That's the real principle behind it. It's the potential of what that seed can be if it's planted. If it's not planted, it'll remain a seed, just a little bit of faith. No, that seed has potential, but it has to be planted, it has to be used. And in that scripture, Jesus goes and he immediately explains a parable. He goes, what, what person who has a servant, you know, sits there and waits on the servant? No, the servant goes out, you, you give a command, you give an order to your servant. And we understand, according to that scripture, that faith is your servant. So if you want, so faith, in other words, watch this, God's given you faith, and faith will work for you, but you have to give it an assignment. You've got to tell it to do something. That's how your faith grows. Okay, that's a whole other message, so I won't get into it today. But understand that. That's what, J, you know, David's walking in that faith. He had planted that seed. Okay. When you're prepared, you're not taken by surprise. This, look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. Because sometimes, see, we, get, we can get mixed up in, in what Christianity is or isn't, okay? We get mixed up. Now, first, first Peter chapter number 4, verse number 12 says this. Beloved, do not think it strange. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. This is, this is what blows me away about Christians. They get attacked. They get a trial. A tribulation comes along. And it takes them by surprise, like they weren't expecting it. Now, what, you know what that tells me? They don't know the Word of God. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. That's what Jesus said. You're going to have it. But be a good cheer, because I've already overcome it. That means you're not going to have it. Not going to have some pain or suffering. That's going to take place. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have fiery trials. Those things are going to happen. You know why? We have an enemy. He hates us. <coughs> and he doesn't sit back. He comes after us. And he, best, and he really comes after us at our weakest point. That's what he does. He waits till we're weak. Then he comes at us. Boom, boom. And then we like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Okay, what's the scripture say? You will have tribulation. Don't think it a strange thing. When this happens, understand it is going to. If you've not experienced some tribulation lately, or how about this, persecution. Let's, let, me, let me just say this. If you've, if you've not experienced persecution, you're not serving God. If, you, if you've not experienced persecution, you obviously don't desire to live a godly life. Because the scripture says, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. That's the scripture, okay? So if you haven't been persecuted, you probably don't desire to live a godly life. Now, so, so, so these are some, here, how, don't you just love these encouraging words today? These are some, some, these are some great promises from God, okay? These are, these are in the word. These are great promises from the word of God, okay? We can bank on these things. Now, that's why we shouldn't be caught off guard. These things, we know they're coming. We know, well, the Bible says that no weapon will be formed against me. No, it does not. That's not what it says. Here's what it says. It says no weapon formed against you will prosper. It does not say that weapons wouldn't be formed against you. As a matter of fact, it infers that they will be formed against you. They just won't prosper. Okay? So we should be expecting weapons to be formed against us. We should be expecting trials and tribulations. We should be expecting persecutions. Those things are promised to us from the Word of God. However, Jesus said, in spite of those things, you can overcome these things. You can defeat these things. I've given you weapons. I've given you the Word of God. I've given you my name. I've given you a word of your testimony. I've given you things to overcome these things. But you've got to do them, right? You have to be prepared, okay? So we should expect problems. We should expect that to happen. We should expect tribulations. We should expect weapons to become uh, formed against us. So we want to, 
We want to be available. See, why are we available? We want, because when God calls us, you know, you know when God called Esther? Remember that? For such a time as this, right? She was raised up and called. But she didn't just sit around and wait. She spent 12 months, one year, preparing for her encounter with the king. She didn't wait for him to summon her. She was busy getting prepared through ointments, rec- representing the anointing, basically. Ointments and perfumes and things that she was going through, this process. And she was listening to godly advice from someone that God, that she recognized had some wisdom. Remember that guy, Hege? He was in charge of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of all the things with the, with the king. So whenever she was to come before the king, she went and said, what do you, what do you suggest? What do you suggest? See, this is the idea. When God's called us to do something, you know, say, well, God's, a, God's called me, you know, to, 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 to be a computer engineer, okay? All right. So what do, you, what do you do? Just sit and wait? No. You go, you start researching, you go online, you, you go different places, you say, where can, I get, where can I get some education, where can I get some schooling so that I can learn some of this stuff so that I can be prepared whenever that job comes. Just like we did for the ministry. We knew God was calling us to the ministry, but we just didn't quit our jobs and go into the ministry, but we did start reading the Word. We started studying. We started going through systematic things to learn the Word of God. We started taking opportunities to preach. We started doing whatever we could do. And then when that time came, we were prepared. You understand? We were prepared. We knew what to do. We trusted God. We'd already put we put the word of God in us so much that it was just like a fire shut up in our bones. We couldn't wait to get it out. And guess what? Twenty years later, we still can't wait. I mean, we just like we're like, is Sunday here yet? Gosh, it's only Saturday. Geez, I have to wait another day to go get up and share the word. You know, we're so excited about it because I don't know. We just get excited. We just like, we're not, we don't even know what burnout is. We've heard people get that in the ministry. You ever hear of anybody that gets that? We, we've, we've talked to people and heard about people that supposedly they're, they're in the ministry serving God, and, and I believe they are. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not. Okay, they're serving God, and, and they get burned out. Like, how does that happen? I'm not sure how that happens. I, I mean, something, you open some kind of door, or something happens, or all of a sudden, it, it becomes mundane, and it's no longer exciting. And I know one thing. You know, for us, we keep ourselves stirred up. We keep ourselves stir- stirred up. We, 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 we so love God's Word, we, we, never get, we never get bored with it. Because the Holy Spirit is continually revealing th- things to us from the Word of God. I mean, if you've heard me preach 20 years ago, it, it's... I preach different stuff now. I mean, some of the same basics, obviously, but there's other things come out because the Word of God is ever living. It's always, you know, there's always revelation coming forth from it. I might be sharing Wednesday, I'm not sure, but from the Word of God, you know, just some analogies, you know, you get the milk. You know that? The milk of the Word? You get the honey. There's a difference. You get the milk and you get the honey. You also get the meat kind of interesting and you have to have a balanced diet you don't just want one you got you got to have milk and meat together lo- along with the honey milk the milk is the is the pure word of god it says desire the pure milk of the word okay but you know what the honey is i'll share this i think i, I think i'll share it wednesday don't hold me to it because you never know the honey is the revelation it's the revelation it's the revealing that comes from the spirit of god that's what the honey is all right so we don't want to miss opportunities because God has divine appointments for us. I remember years ago I was involved in some financial things and financial, I was, I was doing some motivational speaking and things like that and business seminars, kind of interesting. And one of the acronyms was uh, POOR, you know, what makes people poor, P-O-O-R. And um, it is, um, it's whenever you are, I forget what it means now. Anyway, it has something to do with opportunities that you're never, <laughs> I forgot what it was. I wrote down, I wrote it down, I forget. It was something about, what is it? <laughs> Opportunities regularly, pa- passing, passing. That's the P. Okay, I got, it's coming. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, I need them. Passing over opportunities regularly. 
Opportunities come and you're passing on them. Why? Because you're not prepared. You're not ready. Opportunity comes up, it's a good opportunity, but I'm just not ready for that. Why weren't you ready for it? You were believing God for that. You see, you have to, you want to be ready. You want to be ready. You want always be prepared. Amen? We always want to be prepared. One of the things I remember, you know, my dad trained me, you know, when winter time comes, or, or you know, in the fall. So right around November, right around November, at that time, I get a box. I find a box, and I put a pair of boots in that box. I put a knit hat. I put gloves. I put a scarf. I put a heavy coat, and I stick it in my trunk. So what's that for? Well, what happens if you break down? You know, you're going somewhere, and you don't have a coat. You don't have, you know, you, don't have, you got dress shoes on or something like that, and all of a sudden, your car breaks down, and it's a winter storm. Well, we're prepared. Now, thank God it's never happened to us. But I can tell you this, if it ever did, we'd be prepared. We wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have to go out, even if you had to walk a half mile. If you ever walked a half mile, bitter cold and snow, I mean, you, you don't want to do that if you're not prepared. Okay, so you want to get, you, you know, we would get in the back of the trunk, get our boots on, and we would be able to walk, you know, somewhere if we, if we needed to, you know, through the cold and not, and not freeze to death or get frostbite or something like that. Why? Because prepared. It's just, it's just making a preparation. And so this is what we want to do. We know God's called us to certain things. The number one way to get prepared is getting the word. That's the number one way. Get yourself prepared. You know, get the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready when things come. Okay? Always be prepared. What do I have here? The word will take root if it's planted in good soil. Give that word something to work with. You know, when you, read, when you read that word, you should, you, you should be understanding that that word is alive. And that as you read, and it doesn't matter where you're reading in the scripture, okay, if you ask the Holy Spirit to quicken a part of that or whatever it is to you, you'll start to see things, you'll glean something, or there'll be truths that'll come forth from that. You should, when you read the word of God, expect. You should expect answers. And this is kind of interesting because people say, well, I don't have, I don't know how the word of God's going to tell me where to go work. Listen, you read the word while you're asking the Holy Spirit, where, God, where do you want me to work? What job do you want me to take? What job do you want me to turn down? You keep reading the word while you're doing it and trusting God, and God will speak to you. The number one way, you know, God speaks to us different ways. He speaks to us through prophetic words. He speaks to us through dreams. He speaks to us through visions. He's, you know, he speaks to us through his audible voice. I mean, that's kind of rare, but it still does it. I mean, these are things that God will speak to us. The number one way, can I just say this? The number one way that God speaks to us is through his word, number one. That's the most common way that he speaks to us, through his word. That's why it's so important to stay in the word of God, because how many want to hear God? I mean, you know God's speaking, right? He's speaking continually, Okay. Now, let me just, what the, no, no, am I rambling? So, as, as a rabbi, Jesus, when he was walking on the earth, as a rabbi, okay, what would happen is, it's a little different than what we're used to, but a rabbi is a teacher, okay? So what would happen whenever the teacher would get ready to teach, do you know what they did? This is different, it's different than what we're used to, they sat down. You'll read that in the scripture. Jesus would read the scripture. He'd stand to read the scripture. Then once he read the scripture, he would sit down to teach. You see that, you'll see that in the Gospels. Jesus sat down. Rabbis always sat. The students would sit around them, but the rabbis always sat. That's, they sat to teach. That was an indication when a rabbi sat down, he was indicating that he had something to say. So we read the scripture that Jesus has ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. The idea that our rabbi, our teacher, is seated right now, seated, not standing, seated, tells us something. He's got something to say. That means he is right now currently teaching. And if we are disciples, what do disciples do? They're listening. We should be listening. We should be prepared. We should be expecting to receive messages from Jesus because he's speaking to us. Amen? So as we read those scriptures, the Holy Spirit quickens that word to us. Whatever situation we need, it doesn't matter. Whatever situation, whatever we're praying for, the 
Holy Spirit is the guide into all truth, all truth. So rely upon that. Rely upon that word, but rely upon the spirit within also. And it begins to, as those two join, that's the milk and the wine, by the way. As the milk and the wine join together, the word of God comes forth and begins to reveal things to us. Amen? The wine representing the spirit, right? The milk representing the word. All right, hallelujah. Let's go ahead and stand on our feet. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the opportunity to be able to look into your word. I thank you, Lord, that we are a people who are prepared. We are not going to be caught off guard when something comes against us. We're not going to be thinking it's strange when fiery trials come against us. We understand, Lord, that we live in this fallen world. We understand that we are human beings. We understand that as long as we're in this world, we're gonna, there's going to be struggles. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulation. But we're of good cheer. We're not focused on those things. We're not afraid of those things. Lord, because we have you as our strength. We have the weapons of God as warfare. We have your word. We have your spirit. We have your name. We have our testimony. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we can use those weapons to be overcomers of all things. Thank you, Lord that we don't get caught off guard, but we're prepared for all things. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 Love you all. Stay prepared.